If you find yourself at sea during a hurricane or a storm, this is probably the safest boat to be in, since it can self-right itself in about 12 seconds. I suppose a submarine would technically be much safer in a hurricane, but among surface boats, this is the one. The 47-foot motor lifeboat, or simply 47 MLB, is a rescue boat operated by the United States Coast Guard. It can handle winds of up to 60 knots and break surf of up to 20 feet. In a nutshell, it's a beast. The 47-foot MLB is in fact very special, but some of those features were not without controversy. The concept behind the self-riding feature is actually simple, as you'll see. But if you're prone to seasickness, I highly recommend you avoid this boat at all costs. As you can imagine, the ride is not exactly pleasant. But fortunately for you and me, we can avoid the seasickness and just watch this video, because the crew that operates the MLBs love filming themselves and others who are in distress. So we can show you things like this. By the way, don't feel bad for this guy who was stuck in the storm. He's probably the luckiest bad boy you've ever met. But why after being rescued he walked away and was then arrested by the police is not what you think. You can't just have anyone operate this beast in a storm. Those badges are called surfman checks and they represent every surfman going back decades ago. The surfmen are the guys and gals who make the motor lifeboats special. They are the ones who operate the boat in surf and heavy weather conditions and go out in weather that even the saltiest of sailors wouldn't dare. And on top of that, they save lives. No wonder that the old motto of the US Coast Guard, or more precisely, the old US Life Saving Service was, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. With that said, the surfman's primary objective is actually avoidance, that is, to avoid waves at all costs. But in practice, that's an impossible task. This is why surfmen train, and they train a lot. It can take up to six years to earn the elite certification of a surfman. The enlisted petty officers receive training at the Coast Guard National Motor Lifeboat School, which is located in a very dangerous place, the mouth of the Columbia River. Nicknamed the Graveyard of the Pacific, since 1972, more than 2,000 ships have been lost in this fire hose shaped region. But what makes this area so dangerous? Columbia River is the largest North American river that flows into the Pacific Ocean. The current from the river, traveling at speeds of up to 7 knots, can be accelerated by an outgoing tide. The current then collides with the incoming swell from the Pacific Ocean over the bar's shallow waters. This creates extremely steep breaking waves, even on a relatively calm day. The Columbia River Bar is considered the world's most dangerous entry to a major commercial waterway. No wonder those handful of individuals who safely navigate the Columbia Bar make 180 grand a year. The surfman training is considered one of the most challenging water rescue training programs in the world. All gear worn by the surfman is important, including a dry suit, helmet and a life vest. But it's the heavy weather belt that is the most critical. The heavy weather belt allows the crew to stay connected to the boat, in case the boat is struck by a wave or even flipped over. But as we mentioned earlier, their priority is to avoid waves, which looks something like this. There is a wave peak and two shoulders, the near side and the far side, relative to the position of the boat. This means you have two options slow down and go toward the near side shoulder, or speed up and travel toward the far side shoulder. Just avoid the wave breaking over the boat. While it may seem easy and fun trying to outrun the waves, in reality you're never 100% sure if you can avoid the breaking peak of the wave. 
For this reason, surfmen are also trained on how to deal with breaking waves. Positioning the boat toward the incoming waves is called squaring up. This allows the boat's bow to absorb the wave's energy and keep moving forward. It may look like an exhilarating experience, but it forces you to realize how small you are when you're looking up at a gigantic wave coming at you. And if the boat is not squared up, a wave can hit the vessel on the side and flip it over, which is known as knockdown. And even worse, the boat can capsize and pull everyone on board underwater. This is where the heavy weather belts become vital lifelines. It may take as little as 10 seconds for the boat to self right but ask anyone who's experienced something like this and they'll tell you, it feels like eternity. But how can this boat self right itself while regular boats would sink after capsizing? Every major coast guard around the world utilizes self riding lifeboats for obvious reasons. Some pilot boats also use the self riding design as they often operate in extreme conditions. These boats self right with the help of built-in ballasting and having the right weight distribution. A boat needs three things in order to self right First, the center of gravity must be very low and second, the center of buoyancy must be very high. This means a capsized boat would always tend to flip around and upright itself, but not without the third component. The vessel must maintain watertight integrity, otherwise it will fill up with water and sink. For example, the 47-foot MLB has 11 separate watertight compartments as well as a sealed buoyancy tank that is located above the flying bridge. This helps make the vessel unstable in the capsized position, forcing it to upright. But just because the 47 MLB has the self-riding capability, it doesn't mean surfmen purposefully try to roll over their motor lifeboats during training. According to its marketing brochure, the boat flips back up with fully functional equipment. According to the actual operators, however, capsizing an MLB would most certainly result in some sort of damage, be it superstructure, broken electronics, or even popped out windows. As a result, most MLBs in service spend their entire operational life without capsizing or having to self right themselves. There's talk that some surfmen do bring their boats close to capsizing during training, and occasionally some actually capsize. That said, even though surfmen tend to record most of their training sessions with their cameras in order to analyze both their mistakes and achievements, we're only able to find limited footage of MLBs actually capsizing, except when in a controlled environment. While numerous models of boats have the self riding capability, the 47-foot MLB is also special in many other ways. Designing the 47 MLB took multiple years and several prototypes, which in many cases included a trial and error approach. The 47-foot MLB is the successor to the 44-foot MLB, operators of which played an essential role in designing the new MLB. In fact, some of the most important changes during the development of the vessel came from the operator's constructive criticism. The biggest difference between the older and the newer MLBs is the enclosed operating station which provides excellent comfort for the crew. The 47 MLB has four control stations. On the open bridge, there are two control stations. One primary control station on the starboard side that has a complete set of gauges and electronics and a console with minimal gauges and controls on the port side. These control stations can be used in both sitting and standing positions. The other two control stations are inside the enclosed bridge, with each operator having access to a full range of electronics, gauges and controls, located between the seats. The crew of four which operate the boat begin each mission with a risk assessment. This is a step-by-step -step process to numerically rate various factors, like sea and weather conditions, crew experience and vessel conditions. Depending on the total point, the crew may proceed, 
request a further review or call off the mission. The goal is to avoid high-risk missions that could endanger the crew. The biggest design challenges of this boat were the lack of space in the enclosed bridge, minimal visibility aft of the enclosed bridge, and the quality of the seats. The test team was not a fan of the seating quality on the original prototype, so the seats were redesigned until the test team was satisfied. The recently upgraded motorboats have five shock mitigating seats located on the open bridge, and this makes sense. Riding over those huge waves is not exactly a smooth ride, probably feels something like riding a bull in a rodeo. One huge design change compared to the old MLB is the fly-by-wire control system, which instead of a wheel and levers, uses a joystick to control the boat. Additionally, many controls and gauges on the control station were removed in order to simplify the boat's operation. The 47 MLB has a deep V planing hull, which allows it to exceed its hull speed. With a top speed of 27 knots, the motorboat can operate at seas of up to 30 feet. However, maneuvering problems were identified with the original design, where employing large canted rudders resulted in some unpredictable behavior in high-speed turns. To fix the problem, 21 different skeg and rudder configurations were tested in order to determine the most optimum performance during both calm and rough water conditions. But let's talk about this boat's controversial design change. The most unusual features of the 47 MLB are the side recesses that allow the MLB crew to position themselves close to the water in order to aid the recovery of personnel. The open bridge console stations are purposefully located directly above the side recesses, so visibility and communications during rescue operations are greatly improved. This was the first time that such a feature was added to a Coast Guard craft, and it turned out to be controversial. While the crew loved the side recesses for their functionality, the structural engineers were not happy about them. In their opinion, they weakened the hull structure. After going back and forth on whether to keep the side recesses or not, the engineers ended up performing stress testing to see if the side recesses in fact degraded the integrity of the hull. And they didn't. A huge win for the operators. Another victory for the MLB operators was the tow line. The tow line operators insisted on having a long primary tow line. It was outfitted originally with a 900 foot, 3 and a quarter inch circumference double braided nylon tow line. But during testing, retrieving the tow line manually proved to be extremely difficult, causing fatigue for the crew. So a powered storage reel was developed and retrofitted on the prototype in order to retrieve the towing line. But the 47 foot MLBs are starting to run out of time. The 47-foot MLB entered service in 1997 at a cost of $1.2 million per boat and with a projected service life of 25 years, which means they're running out of time. The US Coast Guard currently has 117 47-foot MLBs in inventory, and of those, 107 are in active use. This is why those 107 boats are currently undergoing a service life extension program at a total cost of $190 million. This will add an additional 20 years to their life by replacing their obsolete propulsion engines, which are increasingly difficult to maintain and repair, and improvements like changes to structural components and the updating of their electronics. Now, let's go back to this lucky bad boy. On February 3, 2023, the U.S. Coast Guard was conducting a training exercise with their future surfmen in the mouth of the Columbia River when they suddenly received a distress signal. A 35-foot yacht was struggling in heavy surf with a single person on board. The training crew, which was nearby, answered the call. But as a newly minted rescue swimmer approached the vessel, a large wave hit the yacht, which completely rolled it over and threw the man overboard. The man was pulled by the rescue swimmer to safety as he was lifted into a helicopter. 
He was then transported to a hospital to be treated for mild hypothermia. But here's where the story gets really interesting really quickly. You ready? It turns out that the yacht had been reported stolen and the thief was actually wanted by the Canadian authorities. Oh, and a few days earlier, the same guy had been caught on security cameras leaving a dead fish on the porch of a house that was featured in the classic 1985 film The Goonies. The 35-year-old man, who was Canadian, was wanted back home for criminal harassment and mischief. Lucky for him, by the time the police had seen the Coast Guard's photos and realized it was the same person they were looking for, he'd already been released from hospital. But his luck soon ran out when he was arrested and charged with theft, criminal mischief and endangering another person's life. He dropped off a dead fish and almost became one. Unfortunately, the police weren't able to confirm the identity of the dead fish. <laughs>